The last section we brought up the topic of GAAP, the Generally Accepted Accounting Principles. In this section we're going to be digging a little deeper into some specific rules that we follow for accounting. So this section is the Principles of Financial Accounting, Understanding the Framework. So I mentioned in the last section that the, the whole purpose for having these standard rules is because we need consistency. You as an investor or as a banker, as a creditor, you need to be able to compare company A to company B. Now, if everybody's using their own measurement techniques, you can't really do that comparison. So there is a need for the consistency, and therefore we have relatively consistent standards. That takes us to the second bullet point here. What we're saying here is that when we say consistent standards, there's not just one method for everybody to use. There are some alternatives that have been approved by the standard by the FASB, the Financial Accounting Standards Board. So they've approved alternatives, and companies still have the option to choose between alternative A or alternative B. So it's not exactly 100% consistent, but it's better than everybody making up their own rules. At least we only have maybe three options, just taking inventory, for example. We'll see that later on in later chapters. But uh, we have three, maybe four options to choose from. And at least if they disclose what method they're using, and maybe another company is using a different method, you can at least take that into consideration. So flexibility, the reason there are those options is that different companies and different industries may have a good reason why they do need to use a different standard. So as long as they disclose the standard they're using, we're considering that to be all right. Now when we talk about these rules, I'm using the term rules very generically. Uh, principles is another generic term. But different textbooks and different courses, different instructors, they use some terminology a little bit differently. We have four different terms up here, principles, concepts, assumptions, and constraints. There are some cases where these terms are used somewhat interchangeably. What I'm going to tell you right now is that it's not really a big deal if you say, uh, let's say, the, uh, the accounting entity. That's one of them we'll talk about a little bit later in just a bit. The accounting entity principle, the accounting entity concept, it really doesn't matter what that last word is. Just understand it's an idea, it's a rule that we're following. So because of that, I just want to point out, don't get too hung up on principles, concepts, assumptions, constraints. Remember the base rule. What is it we're talking about? And that's actually what we start in this next bullet point. The accounting entity, and again, I'll, I'll just throw out concept or principle. It really doesn't matter what you call it. When we talk about the accounting entity concept, we're basically saying that we want to make sure in accounting that we are separating the owner from the company. In other words, we don't necessarily want to know how the owner is doing individually. So if it's a sole proprietorship, for example, we don't want to know about their checkbook, their personal vehicle, their personal house. That doesn't need to be in the financial statements. We only want to see what resources the company has itself. So whatever the owner has invested in the company. That's what we're talking about with the accounting entity principle. And I'll just use another term interchangeably. Then we get into the consistency and comparability. This rule basically says that whenever possible, we want to make sure that a company uses the same standard year after year. So I'm going to throw out some terms we haven't talked about yet. For inventory, there are a few different methods. A couple examples are FIFO and LIFO. So if a company decides to choose to use FIFO for this year, the consistency principle says, hey, you should use FIFO next year as well. Now, it's not an absolute requirement, though. A company can switch between their inventory methods or their depreciation methods or their revenue recognition methods, but they have to disclose what, they, what change they have made, why they decided it was a better method, and furthermore, digging a little deeper, when a company actually publishes its financial statements, they publish generally more than one year. They may throw out five years, let's just say. So in that annual report, they're going to show you this year and the past four years of statements. The reason for this is that investors like to see a trend. 
They like to see that revenue has been steadily increasing, uh, expenses have been decreasing, so they want to see that. Looking at one year by itself doesn't really do you a whole lot. So what I'm trying to get at here is when they publish these four different years of statements, if they decided to change to a new method, they actually have to go back to those earlier four years and change the method there as well so that that makes it more comparable. If they're giving you five years of statements, all five of those years now would have used the same method for inventory or for depreciation, whatever the case may be. Conservatism principle. What we're saying here, this is very pervasive throughout accounting. We're saying we don't want to be overly optimistic when we're giving information to the external parties. We don't want to make things seem like they're better than they are. Uh, we don't want to paint a rosy picture and then to come back and have that not come true. The reason for that is that when investors see this great picture, this great prediction that, oh, next quarter we're going to have great revenues, great sales, and then all of a sudden it falls flat, they get a bit concerned. They think they've been misled, and that, again, that leads to distrust. We'd rather err on the side of caution and give them news that's maybe not so great, uh, a conservative prediction. And even if, it's, even if the reality comes out better than that, that's fine. Investors would rather have a good surprise than a bad surprise. That's really what we're getting at here. The current conservatism principle, don't be overly optimistic. That's what we're saying. Materiality. This is another... It's, often referred to as a constraint. And what we're saying with this is that we are not necessarily looking for 100% accurate information down to the penny. We look at materiality, we say, does this difference, This uh, maybe it's an error that we find, does it really matter? Is it going to cause anybody to make a different decision? If they had known the perfect information, would they have made a different decision? Now, the reason this is important is that there is a cost associated with gathering data, identifying information like that, and we're not necessarily willing to, to pay for perfect cost. Instead, we have to analyze the costs and benefits and figure out whether it's really worth it to, to do that extra accounting, extra tracking of the data. Full disclosure, what we're saying here is that investors should have access to all relevant information about the company all of the relevant financial information that they need to make a decision. Now, that's not saying they have access to all the company's trade secrets, for example. Coke investors don't get access to the Coke recipe, the secret recipe. KFC investors don't get access to the lemon herbs and spices, all of that. We're not saying they get access to everything. It's just any information financially that they should have access to to make a decision. The next bullet point here is objectivity. And what we're saying here is that the information presented should be fact-based rather than someone's opinions or estimates. Now, when I say estimates, by the way, there are some situations where estimates are allowed in accounting because there is no fact-based information to use, and that's fine. What we're saying is wherever possible, we want information that's fact-based. We don't want somebody to spin the information. The monetary principle or unit of measurement principle, we're basically saying here that accounting is tracked in some sort of currency, some unit of monetary measurement. In the United States, we use the dollars. In other countries, they use their own currency. That's all we're saying. We're trying to track things in some form of money rather than a, an actual unit of product or uh, hour of labor. We don't track that for the financial statements. We track everything in a cost or a revenue. I'll just use dollar amount, whatever unit of, uh, whatever monetary unit you use in that company. So with the historical cost principle, again, we're, we're basically saying that we record the asset at its original cost, whatever we originally paid for it. It does not increase through the fair market value. Uh, we, we're not concerned about the increases. We're not trying to match the change in fair market value. We leave it recorded at its original cost. Now, the other side of this 
is that uh, there are some assets, some investments in certain things that we may actually increase. We may basically have an exception of the historical cost principle. Investments where there is a good market tracking the change in, in value, a reliable market, then we may use that instead. The time period principle, or the periodicity principle, is basically saying that we track everything in the company in various periods of time. It could be months, quarters, years. And the reason for this is that we want to be able to compare one quarter to the next quarter, one year to the next year, things like that. And the time period principle comes up a little bit more when we talk about adjusting entries because it's all about when the cutoff is for the period and when we want to record revenues or expenses versus when the cash changes hands. The next thing is the accrual concept. So accrual accounting is really what we talk about when we're looking at double entry bookkeeping, when we're looking at financial statements for a publicly traded company. We're concerned with the accrual basis of accounting. And essentially what that means is we're not so concerned with when the cash changes hands for example, we can record a revenue before we've received the money, and we can record an expense before we've, we've paid that bill. What's the, what the concern is, is when did we really earn the money, when did we earn the revenue, and when did we incur the expense? In other words, if we benefit from our employees working for us this period, and we're not really going to pay them until next period just due to the way payroll is, we would still record that as an expense this period even though we haven't paid it yet. So the accrual basis of accounting versus the cash basis of accounting, as you can imagine the cash basis of accounting is based 100 percent on when did we actually pay or receive the cash. That actually takes us to revenue recognition and matching. These are both underneath of the accrual basis of accounting the revenue recognition essentially says we can record revenue when we've earned it, regardless of when we receive the cash, as long as there is a reasonable expectation that we will eventually receive the cash. It's not a guarantee. Later on, we'll talk about bad debts where we don't collect, but if there's a reasonable expectation that we will collect, we can count it as revenue at that, in that period. There are different methods of revenue recognition for different types of company companies, and we'll see those in later chapters. Matching principle. This ties into the revenue recognition. This is sometimes referred to as the expense recognition principle. So what we're saying here is whenever we have recorded the revenue, whatever period we record it in, we want to try to match up expenses that relate to that revenue. In other words, if we are a delivery service, for example, that uh, we earned some money this period, we provided service, and we had to use labor, we had to use gasoline, we had to use depreciation for the vehicle, we want to try to record all of those related expenses this period to match up with the revenues. And finally, the uh, we have the qualitative characteristics of accounting information. This is uh, sometimes we're sometimes presented in a chart format. We basically have two different things we're looking at. For information to be useful in making a decision, it needs to be both relevant and reliable. So I've broken down the, diff the different characteristics of relevance and reliability. To be relevant, information has to have one or both of these two values. Predictive value means that we can use this information to predict the outcome of something in the future. So how well the company is going to do in the future based on this information. Feedback value is after the fact, after something has already happened, this tells us whether that prediction was valid or not. Timeliness, in order to be relevant, information has to be timely. It doesn't do us any good if we don't get this information for a year. We need this information shortly after the period ends so we can make decisions about the upcoming period. Then we move on to reliability. Reliability, uh, sometimes referred to as representational faithfulness. In other words, it faithfully represents what it purports to represent. Basically, this has to be verifiable and neutral. So it has to be fact-based. 
we have to be able to verify it, and it has to be neutral. In other words, nobody has spun the data. 